Let's start with the Fed. So if I'm right, and the thing starts unraveling, I think we see not just the you know one or two cuts the market is now expecting, I think we see a real bona fide Fed pivot. And that is huge implications for gold, monetary metals, other investments. Special coverage from the Gould Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida, is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, here from the floor of the Rules Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this channel. Really looking forward to welcoming back our good friend Lobo Tigre here to the channel. Lobo, independent speculator, really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for making the time. Thanks for being back with you, Kai. I always like talking with you. Always enjoy our conversations. Last time was a couple months ago, three months ago. In, in Frankfurt, two months ago, in Frankfurt. Yeah, that, that other show that I enjoy so much. Exactly, your, your second, or your favorite show, right? Your favorite show? Well, <laughs> no, hard for me to say under Rick Rule's roof. Exactly. But, but, no, but, yeah. no, no, but actually, in all seriousness, you know, I was just asked by that interviewer over there, and I'm like, my favorite shows, this is one. I always get a huge crowd here. Yeah. Uh, and the Deutsche Goldmiss, which is much smaller than this show, I get a bigger crowd. <laughs> like, people, like, my type of people seem to like the Deutsche Goldmiss. I really like the show. So this, this is a true statement. I wasn't paid to say that. I was going to say, I'm going to clip that out and use that in all the marketing material moving forward. No, but I appreciate that, Lobo. And to always enjoy our conversations. Like, you know, as I, I think I mentioned that in May as well. I do miss our Fed talks. We need to get those in the calendar and I need to plan around those more because I've been traveling the last couple of times. It was on my end where we couldn't no make worries. it happen. So we're going to do this again. I've been busy too, but yeah. Right, we're going to do this again. Fed day really, fun. We always love them. Like live reactions to the, to, the Fed, uh, to the Fed announcement and of course the press conference, which is always more fun than the announcement itself. So, um, but let, let's start there. Let's, let's start maybe with the Fed and the U.S. economy and uh, how it is doing since we last spoke. We've got a couple job reports, um, a couple Fed meetings in uh, as, as well. How is the U.S. economy doing? Like, how are things developing? <laughs> I'm sure I'm not going to be the first one to say this. I think that the long and variable lags are finally starting to wind down. And it's an interesting thing that there's been so much talk on the team soft landing side, which was earlier this year morphing into team no landing. And now it's kind of changing back into soft landing again. It's, it's funny. You see on mainstream financial media people saying, you know, instead of dismissing that there's going to be any recession at all, it's dismissing that we're going to have a hard landing. That's, that's now the objective. The goalpost has moved. So the conversation has come back to this recession question. First and foremost, the long and variable lags, the average in the US between the beginning of a tightening cycle and a recession is 27 months plus or minus, which means more or less right now. So all these people who said, we haven't had a recession by now, we're not gonna have one, they're simply historically ignorant or dishonest. Like that's just not true. Starting this month going forward, if we don't have one, it starts getting late. Now, post COVID and all the strange things that happened and market alterations then, uh, it's, it's not really strange that we should have a delay, right? You know, not a lickety split thing. Anyway, we, we don't need to go too far down that rabbit hole. You ask where are we at now? I think that, and, and this is unusual for me, you know me well enough that I, I don't like making predictions and I certainly don't like saying this is happening tomorrow and I'm not quite <laughs> saying that. But the labor market cracks. It's not just like, oh, we got a first surprise. Of, like this is now the second month of weakening data and seriously weakening data. Um, and the consumer side too, that laborer slash consumer, the spending, you know, the, the retail sales number was a disappointment too. So we're having now, it's not just a, you know, a bad report. We're having now a series of bad reports, multiple data fronts. And this is the government's most optimistic data. This isn't like some shadow stats number. Um, so yeah, I think that we are now getting to that point where those long and variable lags are, are starting to be done. We're starting to see the labor market weakening. We're seeing the consumer behavior changing. Uh, and this is a big deal for the U.S. economy. I, th I think, um, you know, I've, I've, I've sounded like, um, my, my metaphor is since Lobo means wolf, I can't be the little boy who cried wolf. I'm the little wolf who cried human. And I've been doing that, you know, for a while, talking about this recession, and it keeps not happening. People are like, Lobo, you're wrong, or where's this recession? I think, I think I will be shown to be right this year. I think we'll start seeing more data, like we're seeing it now. I think we're seeing the beginning of it now, and it will continue unraveling this year. Um, in terms of practical takeaways from this, okay, economics, whatever, 
Fed. Let's start with the Fed. So if I'm right and the thing starts unraveling, I think we see not just the you know one or two cuts the market is now expecting. I think we see a real bona fide Fed pivot. And that is huge implications for gold, monetary metals. Can, can you elaborate on that bona fide Fed pivot? What, what does that mean to you? That means not just 25 basis points in September and maybe another in December. That means like 50 in September. Uh, you know, I, I don't like July 31. I don't know that it'll be convincing enough for them to move then. Though if if CPI, you know, we've got CPI week this week. I have more data before the July 31 uh, meeting. If it shows more economic weakness, we could actually see the odds and we could actually see a 25 cut in July. I'm, I'm not predicting that. I'm just saying that if the data shows it, I mean, the, the Fed itself is telling us they're data dependent. Right. If the data justifies that, given their point of view, which I think is wrong, but given their point of view, then I think we could actually could see that happening. And this is the sort of thing that I think the market is pricing in. And if you look at the market odds, they're actually July's back on the table. It was completely off the table before. It was maybe September, maybe December. July was off the table. Now you're starting to see July come back on the table because of the weakness of this data. So that's not what I mean. When I say Fed pivot, I mean you know, it slowly at first, then all at once, right? I mean, the, the weakening gets much weaker and the Fed says, you know, this is now systemic risk or this is now our second mandate. And and so it's not just a gentle thing. It's like, oh no, we need, we need a looser monetary policy. And that may not mean like, you know, a jumbo rate cut in September, but it would mean, you know, 25 or 50 in September and a significant change in the policy statement highlighting the other mandate, the full employment mandate and the and the systemic risk and that sort of thing. And then you would, you know, maybe even not have to wait for December. You, you would see a more aggressive Fed uh, loosening cycle come in if I'm right about the recession becoming undeniable. Now, here's the beauty, Kai. Sorry, I no, know no. you're going to go there. If I'm wrong... And all we get is what the market expects, you know, one or two rate cuts by the end of this year. There's still rate cuts. That's actually still bullish for gold, even without the recession. And, you know, to, to look at like the mainstream expects something that's bullish from gold from a twenty three, twenty four hundred dollar level. That's that's pretty exciting. It is. It is really looking forward to it. What, what, what might that entail. We'll, we'll get to gold. Um, lo lots of things to follow up on. Um, I think we, we need to start with the jobs reports. And uh, if they were somewhat truthful and not being constantly revised, um, would we have seen already a Fed pivot? Well, maybe, sorry, yeah, like, yeah. No, I was no, thinking no, that I, in my I, head. I get like, what you're cause, saying. Because Jerome Powell is trying to front run a bit of a, you know, negative reports. He said, we want to be more active this time. Instead of right. being reactionary, we want to be more active. Right. So, well, so, trying to anticipate more. Well, A, you know, he's on the inside. So I, I think he and all those people, they, they all know about the changes to the employment numbers and so on. Uh, Peter Schiff, to give credit where due to my fellow Puerto Rican, does a good job of explaining and reminding people about how the U3 number that everybody pays attention to, it's not just wrong or whatever, but the government still publishes the U6 number, which is not identical to, but it's similar to what the employment numbers used to be mm -hmm. until the 90s. And the U6 unemployment number is over 7%. So, you know, what would the Fed be doing if they looked at the, like, if you say, oh, we have the lowest unemployment rate in history going back 50 years. Well, no, if you look at the U6, like the government, not, not right. shadow stats, not tinfoil hat, you know, Lobo, hmm. but the government's own number, it's more similar to what they used to report, is at levels that, you know, if, if, if the headline was 7% unemployment, what would the Fed be doing? They'd be cutting, and, and there's no doubt. So, uh, so I think they know this. I think they're part of the problem. Like they're 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 not just a neutral actor, doing their best. You know, I think they're part of the powers that be overall attempt to massage the situation. And and maybe the most charitable thing I could say is that they know if they say, "Well, crap, we're gonna have a recession." then we're going to have, a, like, that would cause such panic and, and it would cause changes in behavior, consumer and produce, you know, corporate behavior that would cause the recession itself. So they can't say that. Like, even if they know that, they can't say that. So, and that's the nicest way I can put it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, no, I don't think we can expect anything different. I think 
you know, they they obfuscate, they try to gild the lily, they try to steer the ship of state, you know, as majestically as they can, more positively can, until they're forced by undeniable data to respond as they have to at that point. Well, you sort of answered my question because I wrote down the critical level. Like, what's a critical level? Is five handle, six handle on the unemployment data? I'm a due right? diligence guy. I, I know, kick I rocks like, <laughs> and pick stocks. I don't know what the correct unemployment level it's is like, or where, whatever. Where do you get nervous, but, right? To, to, but to, to, that's, that wouldn't be me. I, I think, though, that actually it would be my guess. Mm-hmm. I'm not an economist. My guess would be it's lower than that. We're at 4.1. And I, a four handle is already making people nervous. It's already changing consumer behavior. We're, you know, we're seeing this in the numbers. You know, we're seeing this in the election. Like Joe Biden is unpopular and Team Biden keeps running around. We got the greatest economy in the world, right? Lowest unemployment, historically low. You're like, oh, it's growth, all these wonderful things. Why why doesn't Joe get any credit for this? Well, that's because go to the supermarket. Like your life is, your people are downgrading their lives. The official statistics say everything's great. Reality says something else. I think Jerome Powell was asked that exact thing by by a reporter during one of the last press conferences. I'm not sure if we talked about that before, but like the question was like, well, when everything is honky dory, why does it feel like crap? I think I'm paraphrasing the question, obviously, but it's like, why doesn't it feel like we're in a healthy economy? Right. I I must have missed that one. What did he Uh, say? I was like, he, he can't explain it. Yeah. Oh, it's a mystery. Right? Yeah, it's, yeah a it's a mystery. Like, yeah, why no. does everybody it's, feel it's like we're... It's not a mystery. It's because yeah. you're lying. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> right? Um, right? What else can a liar say? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You know, a good segue to talk about maybe recession as well from the jobs report is the SOM rule. Like, I've been reading about that the other day, and uh, it sort of means the SOM rule is explained. You take the unemployment data of the last three months, you average it out. So for this year, it's there. Where the last three months, it's 4%. And you compare it to the same period of the last year and average out, and it's 3.6%. And the SOM rule says if it's over 0.3%, uh, higher than you're in recession. Like it seems overly right. simplified. You can always find probably a theory well, I, that fits your narrative. I would actually say it seems overly mathematized. Like, you know. Re- like I, you always find a theory that fits your narrative, right? So I'm curious, like, okay. like I'm trying to get I, to- I wasn't going to gonna re- go there. What I was going to say is like, it, it's, even even the definition of recession, like it's it's two quarters of negative GDP is a definition. It actually is not the official definition. There actually isn't an official definition. If you want to talk official, the NBER declares it as a period, blah, blah, of, of these characteristics. So there, there actually isn't, like, there's not a checklist of numbers that you can say this defines it. It's up to these guys or gals or people at the NBER to declare it based on their uh, subjective assessment of it. Um, so I, th- I think that makes it a mistake to over-mathematize this and say, okay, here's the number. Oh, we've crossed point three there. Boom, that's going to be it. That said, I actually agree with the finding. My preferred indicator on this, not the SOM rule, is what I call the Gunlock indicator, named for Jeff Gunlock, who's really, you know, it's, it's not me who came to the market with this, it's him, who's pointed out that the long-term moving average of unemployment, when it, when it crosses the current rate, so like it, it's a long-term average, so it's gonna drag, it's gonna follow. So when, it, when, when unemployment goes up and then the long-term line crosses, that's an indicator of an accelerating unemployment rate. That's that's really what that means. That when the long-term dragging, slower moving one crosses the more vol- volatile, rapidly moving one, that's telling you that something is happening now and there's an accelerating movement. And if that's unemployment, right, that makes sense. That, that you know, unemployment always accelerates going into and soars during a recession. That's what, why we look at unemployment in recessions. So... So that's been triggered. That's happening now. And this is not you know, one of these things that, oh, it crosses, the lines cross, and then a year later there's a recession. This is one of these things where it crosses and more or less you're in a recession or very near there. So bearing in mind that people, or the officials anyways, only recognize recessions in hindsight, whether it's the Psalm rule or the Gunlock indicator, there are many flashing lights right now that are saying the recession is real and it's now. So all those long and variable lag deniers and saying, oh, if it's not going to be one, it's not going to happen. I think maybe I'm wrong, but these, I mean, the gun lock indicator is, has an 80 year track record of success, like hundred percent success. So you can't just dismiss that. I, and I, you know, we'll see, but I, I think if we have this conversation a year from now in this conference, we, you'll be saying, Lobo, you were right. 
Oh, 100% accuracy. <laughs> well, <laughs> right? not me, the yeah, indicator, I know, right? I know, like, on, on the indicator. But, right. uh, Lua, you've always been team hard landing. Um, are you still on the ca- yeah. camp, team yeah, hard landing? that's right. But with the caveat that as soon as that becomes undeniable, the, the money helicopters fly again. So I'm not saying greater depression. In, for that to happen, the powers that be would really have to lose control. Like the money helicopters would fly, you know, rates would, would drop and more stimmy checks would come out from Congress and it wouldn't work. Like if, if they did that and, it, and the economy still tanked and, went, you know, then you, you could get, you know, the greater depression that Doug Casey's been talking about and so on. But I, I don't actually expect that right now. You know, twice well, bitten, five times shy on that one. Um, it wouldn't I, mean that U.S. be completely cut off from the debt market, I think, if that were to happen. It, you know, if that would happen, then Brent Johnson might be wrong, and we might see the demise of the dollar as a reserve currency a lot faster. And that, you know, a lot of things would happen. For you know, if if that would be big, that would be historic. That would be a total game changer of the global economic order for the U.S.'s house of cards to finally collapse. Uh, that's that's we can write a science fiction novel about that. I'm, no. I, I, let me put it this way. That could happen. That is, let's call it the Joker card in the deck we're playing with. No way to say if that's going to turn up this next hand or, no. you know, we could play many rounds before that turns up. But it's in the deck. That could happen. No. My, my answer to your hard landing question, yes, I'm in there. But my point is that I think they'll try to paper it over. They've shown, you know, a great deal of success doing that. They've trained the stock market to think bad news is good news. So undeniable recession could actually make the S&P 500 soar to, you know, 6,000 or something. Or, you know, we could be talking down 50. We're not that far off. Right. (laughs) Well, you know, okay, right. So make it 7,000 or something, whatever. You know, Mm -hmm. like we could see truly, like we think everything now is in ludicrous mode, that that Elon Musk ludicrous mode button. (laughs) Even that could be nothing compared to what happens if seriously bad news is treated by good news, as good news on Wall Street. So, um I don't want to get distracted with Wall Street. The, the point, the, the point though, for us as resource speculators, you know, gold, silver, copper, uranium, all these other metals that we like in our mining mm-hmm. stocks, oil and gas too, um, is that if in, instead of going through the meat grinder in the recession, we get the money helicopters flying and we get a reflationary boom, the, the recession could be the thing that sparks the next big leg up. So in a way, they're making a kind of a bullish case, mm-hmm. bullish case even for industrial metals. And my only hang up there is, you know, again, the, pr- the practical takeaway is we have to have that undeniable recession first. They're not just going to inflate this next huge bubble because Joe Biden wants to get elected <laughs> again. He's unelectable now anyway. Never mind. <laughs> we don't have to go down that rabbit hole. The point is that it has to become undeniable first. That's what I mean by hard landing. And then once it becomes undeniable, I, I do think we see a major pivot, not just the Fed. You know, and and. And that has me actually very bullish. I think it's extremely inflationary. It's very bullish for all the things all our, hmm. our, our dear audience holds dear. Yeah, absolutely. We're at a commodities conference. We've got to be positive on that, of course. So, um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, I had uh, Joel Lippmann sitting in your chair yesterday, and uh, he was talking about... I wondered about that. I felt kind of joke. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, um, but, but he's talking re-dollarization instead of de-dollarization, and he's talking about uh, you know, real economic indicator for, or health of the economy indicator, like taxes versus GDP for, or uh, versus... Um, yeah, tax versus GDP, tax income. Like who's actually generating the most tax income? And then he looked at the interest payments versus tax income and how healthy sort of that relationship is. So the US, I think tax income is about $5 trillion, $4.85 trillion. Interest payments are about a trillion. So he's just, there's a lot of way to go. Right. And well, this is another one of those things where I'm not an economist. Yeah. I can't take on those arguments head to head. I'm a, I, it, it I just comes down for a living. Like, it comes down to the but, debt discussion, but, right? No, like, but and I take the point. I can address the point. Yeah. And um, in a way, it, it you know reminds me of our good friend Brent Johnson and the dollar milkshake theory. Brent's thesis is not that the dollar is somehow magically superior to other fiat currencies and never meets its ultimate fate. His thesis is that the dollar goes out on strength, not weakness. Like because of the way international monetary flows work, and because it's not just the dollar as you know a currency. But it's the substrate for debt, global debt, you know, you know, Argentinians lend to Chileans in dollars and that sort of thing, right? So the, the, 
the disuse of the dollar causes scarcity, which can cause the dollar to go up. So it it, it actually can, you know, his, his, his words are it dies on strength and that might fit with this thing. All of this stuff I think is, I won't just say it's beyond my pay grade. I'll address it more directly and just say, I'm very reluctant to bet my fortune, state my fortune on a theory. I'm, I speculate not just on, you know, we're here at Rick's conference. You know, is one of his favorite things is don't confuse the inevitable with the imminent. Like you have this theory about the end of the dollar or whatever. Maybe it's inevitable. I might even agree that it's inevitable. It's a fiat currency. The end of the dollar is inevitable. I will stipulate that. Doesn't mean it's going to happen this year. Didn't mean it was going to happen last August 24th when the BRICS adopted their gold back currency, which didn't happen, right? You know, people get all excited about all this stuff. That's inevitable, but it's not imminent. Um, so my answer to this is, I don't know if Joe's right or wrong. I don't know, you know, when Brent will be right or wrong. I know that the gold dollar exchange rate is near nominal all-time highs, even while the dollar is showing strength. So I'm not worried about a resurgent dollar this year. I think everything else is bullish for the dollar, even in a high dollar environment. We're in a high dollar environment right now, and we're looking at high gold dollar. Like, and there are times, and the most obvious times are times of war. When Russia invades Ukraine, for example, it's a hobby of theirs. They do it from time to time. Um, you'll see gold and the dollar go up at the same time. That's the fear trade, well, safe haven that. trade, yeah. right? And I think it's a mistake to see the dollar as a safe haven. But at that moment, sure, I get it. Um, so that, that tells you that it's not like this cosmic law of the universe that the gold has to go down when the dollar goes up. Under correct circumstances, when the market perception is such, the behavior is such, the dollar and gold can go up. And one could argue that even without some new war in the universe, uh, that's happening right now. We're seeing strength in both. So I guess my answer is I'm not worried about it. I'm bullish on gold regardless. And uh, I'll let the economist argue about yeah. whether or not Joe's theories are <laughs> correct. And last economist question here for, you, for the non economist, the economist question to the bond market. What's the 10 year yield telling you right now? It's coming down 4.3% right now in the 10 year. What, what is it trying to tell us? Well, like yields down means bonds up. Um, which can be interpreted as another safe haven. Bid. Like, you know, why is money going into the front running a, 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 a Fed cut? It can be that, or it can be just also fear. Like, I, you know, people talk about the bond vigilantes, right? Yeah. They're going to school the Fed. The bond vigilantes are going to force the Fed to do this, that, and the other. It's not like there's a club somewhere in New York on Wall Street where these people get a vigilante secret ring, you know, in a lapel pin where they can go in and sit down on and say, okay, we're going to make the yeah. Fed do that. It's, it's, <laughs> It's, it's, that's not the way it is, right? It's not people deciding, oh, we're going to buy or sell bonds to make the Fed do this. It's people deciding, I want bonds, or I want this yield, or I don't want bonds. And that has the effect of forcing the Fed's hand sometimes or not, or doing these other things. Um, so when i look at these things i don't think oh the you know the bond vigilantes are, are making the fed do this i look at these things and i say oh people are buying bonds why are they doing that well yes it can be it can be because they expect the fed to cut which means the bond price goes up for the rate to go down or it means they want to own the bonds so 4.3 percent is still an attractive yield especially if you expect uh, fed cuts maybe even down to three you know, percent over the next 12 to i was months. just talking with my wife about some money um a family member is entrusted with her that she has in cash and you know here i am i'm a gold bug died in the wool uranium bull right all this stuff and everything like that and but but it's not her money and, and it might be needed quickly. So it's, she can't just put it in, you know, a great mining stock that right. may or may not pay out in a year or two, even, right? I mean, it's, it's not speculative money. Um, and, and, you know, she, she, it's not her money. She can't lose it. So, but it kills her that it's sitting there in the closet in cash. Not my closet. Don't come <laughs> visit me, right? <laughs> uh, um and I and so you know even me even I said well you know you could buy a, a short a near term bond has a, has a rate like you could get paid some interest while you figure out what else to do like why not yeah. so if even a guy like me could say well how about bonds yeah. government bonds I'm an anarchist and I suggested <laughs> government bonds to my wife and so what a world in which something like that can happen 
very last question on the on the macro side. I actually, I keep coming up with good ones because you, you have good, brilliant answers. Six trillion dollars are sitting on the sideline right now, making five percent in money market funds. Where, where's the threshold once the Fed maybe starts cutting rates? Where's the threshold where that money starts to move? Do you have an? You know, and, I bet Daniela Di Martino both could give you a much better answer for that. You know, I, I get it, and I would say that sure that that makes sense as the Fed cuts, that will put more pressure on that money to do something else. But I'll also say, I, I think it's been several years now that I've been hearing people talking about this huge pile of cash on the sidelines and, oh, it's, you know, it's got to come into the market. Well, you know, it doesn't have to come into the market. You know, it, it, some of it could stay there simply out of fear, you know, not because of yield. And so I'm, I'm just saying I don't know, I guess, Kai. But but more than I don't know, I'm saying it's dangerous to think you do know. Hmm. Oh, that money's got to go here. Like, Mining, the, obviously. The, the, you know, the Bloomberg cheerleaders, oh, it's, all, it's obviously got to go into stocks, right? Well, no, it doesn't. It could actually go into bonds. It could go into real estate. Like, if you really got... if, Like, this whole Tina thing was always nonsense. If, if for a 60-40 portfolio manager... The, the Tina thing was a real world because the real world constraint for them because their world was two assets. Right? But, but the actual real world is a much bigger thing than that. And there are always alternatives. Gold was one that they would, of course, never recognize. But a more mainstream asset that people could recognize if they really started distrusting their options in the financial world, they could start stepping out into real assets. And, and so that's just an example. So like I, I'll takeaway is even if the squeeze gets on and that money has to go somewhere it's dangerous to think you know where it's going to go so louis we have to talk commodities as well we're obviously a commodities focused conference here and uh, you, you gave a talk last year which was quite controversial because you're not giving a talk again this year you're just on a panel this year you just told me so i'm curious like well, what did you say that uh, got you next yeah why did i get uninvited <laughs> well no i know Rick what got still you loves canceled uh, so <laughs> what got you canceled by a libertarian there's a, this is a commodities conference, but it's also pretty much a gold bug conference, I got to say. I mean, how many of these companies are anything but gold and silver? There's a few, but not many. Um, and I had the audacity to stand up there last year and say that uranium was my, my best bet and that uh, that worked out really well. I've, I've had people come up to me at this conference like, oh, that, that call you made last year, that was the best call of the conference and so on. But maybe it wasn't what the... Uh, the sponsors in the exhibitors hall wanted to hear. <laughs> you know, forget all those gold stocks out there. You'll buy uranium. Don't know. Um, but if I so so yeah, this year I'm on the exploration panel. There's a question though: is you know, so what's your talk this year? Well, if I was giving a talk, um, I would have actually torn up my notes last week or so um, because it it had been okay. This year it's gold. It's still gold. Um, but I've added silver back into the mix because silver has been, you know, people call me Dar Silver and all these things, but silver has been correlating more with copper than gold lately. Like you can, you can do the math on that. It's, they still correlate all three, but, but it's striking to see silver correlate more with copper than, than gold. And that's telling you something about silver's industrial side. And I think it's a mistake to just ignore that. Um, but recently silver has been you know it's got its monetary metal mojo back it's been correlated much more with gold it's been moving strongly with leverage to gold and so i can't ignore that so i've i've put silver back on my shopping list the other thing is i was i was you know a year ago i i, I was bullish on uranium but then you know uranium doubled since then it went over 100 bucks now it's correcting and so i might have said okay you know i i got delivery on my expectation for uranium but it has corrected and it's gotten to sort of this boring phase where it's just not doing anything. The, the, the price, the spot price, that is. The market, though, is going gonzo. The supply demand equation is just crazy. The, the, the amount of demand continues to increase. Like we don't even need more demand. The existing nuclear fleet needs more uranium as is. But we already had a demand, you know, a growing demand scenario. And that just keeps sharpening the acceleration curve is increasing where the BRICS countries in particular are building them gangbusters scores of reactors under construction you know coming down the pike and at the same time supply is not keeping up that's not new that's you know the spot hoovered up all those <laughs> secondary supply pounds you know a while ago now um, but there was a question about whether high prices would cure high prices and how quickly would that be well we're seeing the answer to that question now um, 
so what I'm saying is uranium has gotten really exciting again, but sort of in a stealth mode. It, mm -hmm. Since the spot price isn't moving at the moment, people got bored with it. Their attention has wandered off. I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Anybody who missed the big uranium you know, surge last year, I think this is your next best time to get in. So that would be my talk this year. Uh, I'm still in team hard landing, as you and I were discussing before, extremely bullish on gold. If I'm wrong about that, even the Fed is saying it's going to cut this year. That's bullish for gold too. So it's either bullish for gold or really bullish for gold. I'll, I'll take that trade, you know, <laughs> right? And add silver in there and uranium. So that would be my talk, my, my three favorite metals for this year. Maybe, you know, not breathtaking the original, but for what it's worth, I don't say the same thing every year. And that's what I would have said this time. Yeah. Fundamentals for uranium have just improved the last two weeks again, dramatically. Or actually, since we last chatted in May, the U.S. passed a bill banning Russian imports of uranium, including enriched uranium, you just told me, right. uh, before we hit the report okay, so, button. So but, we got to talk through some of those fundamentals like that have changed, potentially. Okay, we, we got to have Justin Hune join us and, mm -hmm. and walk us through the uranium fuel cycle and make sure I don't say anything wrong. But, but bear in mind that the enriched uranium is several steps from what the mine produces. Mm -hmm. And, and so, and there's a lag and there's you know, centrifuging, all this stuff happens in between. So the, the ban on Russian enriched uranium doesn't immediately translate to higher U308 prices, which is the commodity the miners produce. And you can see that right now, like we have the ban and uranium's gone sideways for the next months. No, no change. So, you know, at some point when they've when the utilities have used up what they had and they have to contract for more and the enrichers have sold what they had and they have to contract for more, that, that trickles down. But that, that could take a while. And though it might not be like this forever thing. And again, I'm not the uranium insider, but uh, the way that the ban went in was not only are there exceptions if we really need it, like it's a ban unless we really need it. And we have yet to see how that actually plays out. That's one thing. The other thing is it wasn't an immediate ban. They gave buyers time to mm. stock up. Mm. So I'm, I would assume, and we'll know soon enough, um, that the U.S. buyers have cleaned out the Russian supply. They bought everything they could. So the real question there is how much did the Russians actually have to sell? How much inventory? Mm. I mean, we're talking inventory. It's not contracting for the future because the ban is in a couple of weeks. So it would have to be uranium, enriched uranium for essentially immediate delivery. I don't know what that number is. I don't know if anybody knows what that number is besides the Russians. Um, but I would presume that the users are buying all they can. Like whatever that number is, they're buying it all. And then how long will it be before they have to go find somewhere else? Will that give enough time for the U.S. enrichers to bring their you know, facilities, spin them back up to speed and, and get that going? All of these are question marks. Um, but let, let's suppose... Suppose there's a real crunch here and the U.S. players take longer to get back into the enrichment business um, and, the, and the users need more and there's not enough coming online. You'd say, oh, that's a great crunch. You know, there's, there's a, this demand is exceeding supply. It's going to send prices higher. Well, if the facility isn't there, they, they don't need the mine supply. They don't need the raw uranium coming in because they can't handle it. They don't have the processing facility yet. So you could actually see a situation where there's an acute need for the enriched product but it's not actually moving the demand for the raw product because the processing capacity isn't there I'm, th this isn't a prediction i don't Sounds have a like crystal a ball. market <laughs> <laughs> well or actually rare earths yeah. right you know you can start mining them outside of china but if china is the only place processing them in scale you still have an issue with china right but the the point is i'm i'm just being cautious here about assuming that this must push the commodity the miners produce up and which which is what matters to me as a uranium stock investor i don't um you know i'm not in the enrichment business I, i'm i'm buying miners and explorers and so on and okay there there is one vertically integrated miner that could be a way to to play on this we'll see uh, a lot of question marks here um but the the one thing that isn't a question mark is how any of this is going to make uranium cheaper Right. So, so, you know, where's the bear case? Where's what's going to send uranium back to $30 or, or whatever and put all these miners out of business? I see zero scenario like that, except a Chernobyl scale event. Like, so unless you have something that has literally happened once in 70 years and, and, and Three Mile Island doesn't count, didn't even hurt anybody. 
uh, Fukushima doesn't count. It was the tsunami that killed people, right? Three Mile Island is the only real nuclear accident of any significance in history. It's been one, 70 years. You know, what are the odds that in my investment time frame, something like that is going to happen again? It's basically so low that I don't even consider it. I, I understand that it's, it's a risk that any investment I make in uranium could go to zero if there's a Chernobyl scale event. But that's so unlikely that I don't worry about it. I just invest based on the supply and demand fundamentals, which could hardly be more bullish. Well, it's easy to see the supply side in North America, for example. It's not like I was, I was thinking while you were talking, it's like maybe a new massive discovery changes things. But until that is online, yes, like, yes. we're like, even through if two there more was cycles. A new massive discovery. Say, like, like, if they discovered an Athabasca basin in the middle of Wyoming, right, in the U.S., for example, for yeah. example, because, you know, those Canadians make round bacon instead of proper straight bacon. <laughs> there has to be something wrong with them. Right. So we want American uranium. Right. Um, Suppose they make that. Suppose that discovery is announced today at this conference. It'd easily be ten years before we see a pound come out of the ground there. Right? Easily, and that, that's generous, exactly. right? So it, it would make no difference to supply and demand market in my investment time frame. Very exciting, okay. but completely irrelevant. One more topic on the bull case. Uh, we've seen out of Niger coming out of some news there, more on the geopolitical front. Russia is exerting its power. Uh, Niger has revoked some mining licenses. Orano, one of the French producers, lost their production license in, in Niger. And now all the, the explorers are struggling there as well. Um, yeah. They've been. Oh, one, in, one in particular, you know, another. So, you know, the, the writing is on the wall. They, they're, they're talking positive, but their actions are anything but friendly, particularly to Western companies. So. Um, two things. One is, the, you know, the, the simplest thing and the most important thing, and, and I'm sorry if you're a shareholder in one of these companies and you don't want to face the music, but you got to face the music. This has become a very high risk jurisdiction. Anytime you're making excuses for your company, you know, because things are turning south, but oh, my company might not be so, you know, that's, that's not good. That's wishful thinking. You need to face the music here. Niger has turned into, in my view, a no-fly zone for Western investment dollars. And, you know, I may be wrong, but that's my view. Um, word to the wise or word to the whatever. <laughs> I Take it or leave it. That, that's what. But the other thing is, you know, what is, this, what is the implication for the uranium market? You know, that's kind of interesting. If the pounds start going to Russia and the pounds can't come west from Russia, it all goes to China. So, all, you know, ultimately... It, it's global marketplace. And if China's buying more from Russia, is buying less from the US, and it may ultimately balance. At the end of the day, 50 years from now, it might actually all balance out. But in between, the markets are very inefficient. Before those pounds go to China, they just sit there in Russia, you know, or before China's ready for them, and those are not pounds available in the West. We could see a significant bifurcation of prices, or we could see, you know, a China-Russia price, and we could see a rest of the world price. It, it, and if those pounds aren't available, then that's less supply. So it, it could affect the, the balance of supply. And I, I keep saying could, and that that makes me cautious, right? You know, I like to see you know what's happening now, and I and this is a question mark. I, this is something that I would watch. That you know, the good news is, even without that, you know, the the, the supply constraints are so real, and the demand case is growing so quickly that I'm extremely bullish. We don't, we don't need this extra tailwind. This is like the third or fourth tailwind for an already extremely bullish case. And if it happens, great. If it doesn't, doesn't matter. Buy the dip. Um, well, it, not on Niger stocks. No, but it's a more yes, commodity based. Yes, on yes. uranium plays in general, yeah. particularly the ones that have the goods. Yeah. Uh, if there's a dip there, there, there are some that are still, uh, you know, is it, like you, we this don't have case to talk names, but how, how many junior explorers or how many explorers or developers are there actually in the uranium space? Like I don't have an overview, but it doesn't. I, it can't it, be a lot. No, it's not. Uh, you know, we went from five to five hundred in last big mm. uranium bull, and then it went back to about fifty. But the ones that actually have something that matters within the next few years, it's maybe a dozen. They're, they're not a lot of names. Like I don't have to give you stock picks no. for people to figure out. You know, <laughs> who's actually got a mine or who's building one? That's that's yeah. not much due diligence. Um, 
I was something else I wanted to say, but I've lost the thread, so we'll leave it at that. Yeah. No, no, no worries. Let's uh, let, let's get to the precious metals real quick. Um, you know, I'm really curious, like how much of a potential Fed rate cut is already priced in into a gold price right now? We're trading at 2360 roughly. Like how much is priced in already? Because it's been I, holding up. I think up a steady. fair amount, and that's yeah. maybe part of why we're near the nominal all-time high because it's being priced in. But the but the reality is that when the number drops, there's always a reaction. Mm -hmm. Like even if it's somewhat priced in, you know, you, you might think rate cuts you know, make a big move, and maybe it's not such a big move. I would be extremely surprised if on the day that an expected rate cut is announced that you don't see a movement in the dollar, the 10-year rate, and gold and silver. Usually markets like confuse me. That's why I stopped predicting gold prices because when you expect it to go up on a news day like that, it usually goes down. Yeah, well, I've yeah. seen that too many times. Like. You'll notice that I said you, you, there'll be a response. I didn't say <laughs> what it would be. Exactly. <laughs> so, so sure, prices um, you know, things get priced in, markets are forward looking, I get that. But there's always, call it arbitrage. Like the markets price it in, but you don't know. You're like, you think it'll be this. And so when the reality is there, well, then you close the arbitrage and you see some, you know, final steps. And then if there's some surprise, I, I, I think it'll be, I don't expect a rate cut in, this month. I think that the one in September is likely. Um, if I'm right about the hard landing, we could see a lot more things. But let's just go with the mainstream narrative here and, and the expect what to answer your question about what have the pri the markets priced in. Let's say we get what the markets are pricing in in September. I think I think the reality itself still affects gold, at least at that time. And then the language around the statement, as you and I like to discuss on Fed Day, right? It's it's not the FOMC announcement. It's Powell. And how does he sound? And how dodgy is he on the questions? Does he slip up and actually say some truth by accident, <laughs> right? You know, those sorts of fun so things. When he says the quiet part out right, loud, yeah. Know, so, so the market may have priced in the FOMC uh, statement, but there's no way to price in a Powell gaffe. Okay. Coming to your like, bull, bull thesis from gold, like maybe you summarize it a bit. Like, what do you expect to happen in the next six months that could be bullish for gold to, to really make your thesis come true? Okay, so so first I, I, I see a floor, if you will, not a technical floor, but support from the central bank buying, you know, the global south. China's taking a break and we're still near a nominal all-time high. So it really tells me that this is robust. So it, you know, I don't want to say never say never, but in a world where there are headwinds for gold and China stopped buying, right? You know, and, and still gold doesn't melt down. Uh, that's a lot of strength. I mean, it makes me more confident in being, you know, more aggressive in my buying. Like I'm, 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 I'm aggressive isn't my favorite word. Um, <laughs> But I see much, Confident. well, I, the, the risk reward has skewed much more towards reward. Like, I just don't see that much risk in buying gold stocks now. I mean, company risk. But but the, the, the macro thesis for gold is so skewed towards the bullish with this enormous support from central banks, no less. Um, and then also whoever the new buyer is this year, whether it's Chinese retail or India, I think global portfolio allocation is starting to make that famous Rick rule shift from 0.5 back towards the, the 10 dec sorry, four decade mean of 2%. So I think there's, there's real sustained buying that doesn't just go away tomorrow on a headline of a, of a Fed rate or an employment number unexpected or whatever. So this makes me skew towards the reward side. And on top of this, so that's that's the base case. Like, say I'm completely wrong about everything, and it's just, you know, the, the things proceed as the mainstream expects. Well, the mainstream expects one or two rate cuts this year, which is bullish for gold, starting from a twenty-three or twenty-four hundred dollar base. That's very very encouraging. Now, if I'm right about Team uh, Hard Landing finally having their chance at the victory lap, you know, by the end of this year. Uh, well, then we're not just talking 25 basis points in September. We're talking much bigger cuts. We're talking stimmy checks. We're talking the whole money helicopter gamut. I think that's extremely bullish from gold. And again, starting not from you know 1900 or 2000, let alone prior prices, starting from 23, 2400. Um, Sky's the yeah, limit. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't even want to spit out a mouth, number because yeah, know, it's embarrassing. I, I think I have to wear a tinfoil hat <laughs> to say. But just think about the kind well, of. Citibank said three thousand dollars, so maybe I, I don't know. It's like think um, about we the can headlines. Quote, maybe. Think about the headlines that would generate if that yeah. happens. And, you know, and and uh, here's 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 a data point, not a tinfoil hat thing. Here's a data point: when Newmont beat on there, and I'm not a Newmont shareholder, not promoting Newmont, but it is the world's largest gold miner right now. So when Newmont beat on their Q1 uh, financials. 
that was headline news, not just at GitGo or Soar Financials. That was headline news on Yahoo and on Bloomberg and mainstream finance media because it's the world's largest gold miner. Gold's up. It's in the news. The largest miner beats on their financial guidance. So, and by the way, I won a great beat, <laughs> but they beat, right? So, so, so that, that became headline news. I, I was really, maybe not shocked because it should have happened, but I was really powerfully stricken to see these people who seemed like couldn't even pronounce gold. It's a four letter word, right? Um, talking about Newmont. I never hear see them talking about Newmont. And that was just, you know, baby steps compared to what happens if what you and I just described happened. And, and that's not the Lobo hard landing case. That's the Fed's case of one or two rate cuts is, you know, it's pretty exciting, Kai. Very I, I, I am looking hard. You know, I, I, I can't compromise my standards on what makes for a great exp, uh, great speculation, but I am working hard. And I have a team. We're working hard on looking for new uh, investments to make because I really want to ride this wave. I want as much cash. I, I never go all in, but I'll get as close to all in on my expectations for this market as I ever do. Uh, and you have a fantastic team. I know some of them personally. So fantastic team. But we got we got to wrap it up here. What a f wonderful conversation. Where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you? Easy answer. Independentspeculator.com. There is a free weekly letter. Uh, if you sign up, you may not like or agree with everything mm -hmm. I say, but the one promise I can make is we will not spam you with a flood of daily advertisements. I hate that hype. Um, so check it out. It's free. You know, you can always unsubscribe. I won't annoy you with advertisements and, and then you can evaluate my work for yourself. Fantastic. Lobo, appreciate the time. Like probably the longest interview we've done here at the conference, but I always enjoy chatting with you. There's so much to talk about and digest. So thanks so much for your time and to everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially from the Rules Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you did, please leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. It helps us out tremendously, gets more visibility, brings us phenomenal guests on the channel as well. And uh, we always want to hear from you. What can we do better? Like we're always looking for constructive feedback. It helps us out a lot. And we thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here from Florida.